There we go. Okay, so uh, I am Jeff Harris. I'm the uh, university specialist on honeybees at Mississippi State. So I often talk to uh, beekeepers and their agricultural partners in soybean, cotton, and corn about better ways of protecting honeybees. But I also take the opportunity when I can to talk to gardeners uh, and homeowners who might use pesticides in the yard about better ways to protect pollinators in general during with their use. Um, because uh, your use is not innocuous to pollinators. Uh, certainly anybody putting out uh, pesticides in the environment could have an effect on, on insects visiting their plants or targets of their pesticides. So uh, a lot of this is uh, sort of intuitive, but it doesn't hurt to kind of cover it. Um, and, and what I'd like to do first is sort of give you the importance of pollination in terms of economic value to the U.S. Um, and then just sort of think about the value of pollinators in our native environments. Um, this is just an overview, you know, three quarters of all flowering plants on the planet need an animal pollinator. Um, the other quarter uh, are pollinated by abiotic things like wind, rain, and, and what we call selfing, where they sort of drip, drop a lot of pollen directly on their own flowers, a lot like corn. Um, in the United States, we have at least 120 agricultural crops that I say depend on pollinators, that might be an overly strong term. Some of these crops absolutely are totally dependent on honeybee pollination. If you didn't have the honeybee, you wouldn't get the, the, the crop. And the, and the best example of that is almonds in California. Uh, California grows 85% of the world's almonds. Um, they are about almost a $6 billion a year crop for that state. So it's extremely important and they will not get a single nut if they don't bring in they bring in each year about 1.7 million colonies of honeybees to pollinate that crop. Now, other crops like apples, for example, um, many of our native pollinators are good enough, but oftentimes growers still bring honeybees in as an insurance. So, uh, although apples aren't totally dependent on honeybees or cherries for that matter, uh, they certainly benefit if they bring them in. They, they're, they're guaranteed a fruit set, they don't have to guess. And then of course, in natural ecosystems, um, there are relationships between plants and insects, especially in very fragile ecosystems. I think of a desert ecosystem out in the West where there's over 800 different pollinators in this one county alone, insect pollinators. And that's because there's these tight evolutionary relationships between specific plants and a specific insect. And if you lose the plant, you lose the insect. If you lose the insect, you lose the plant. So pollinators are very important in our natural systems as well as in agriculture. Now I'm most familiar with agriculture because I've been a in commercial beekeeping almost my entire life up until I went to academics. Um, so just to remind you of some of the pollinators out there, it's fairly intuitive birds, including not just our hummingbirds, but things that like to eat flowers like wax wings or orioles and things like that. Bats are incredible pollinators. They love to eat flowers and parts of flowers. And of course the insect pollinators include bees, butterflies, moths, flies, beetles, and, and wasps. And there's a few others, but these are the main ones. In general, there's an impression that all of these pollinators are in decline, especially the insect ones, and there's probably some truth to that. Part of the difficulty in actually documenting this is a lot of places don't have good baseline data to say, hey, what we have now is less than what we had 10 years ago even. Uh, that's changing because of the interest in, in the health of pollinators as, as helping us with our food supply. So people are doing a lot more research on what's out there and what factors in, impact them. Um, so we're getting more information now than we've ever had on some of these pollinators. But there is this general notion that basically there are too many humans out there. Our urban sprawl, our parking lots are destroying natural habitat that these uh, insect pollinators in particular, particular need for either nesting in or, or having food growing in. Um, so there's this notion that things are in declining. And of course, the other things, our pesticide use our, and our, way we, our monoculture and agriculture all affect these pollinators as well. Just to remind you what pollination is, it's basically the movement of the male, uh, uh, basically uh, germplasm in the form of pollen from the uh, male part of one flower, the anther, to the female part, um, stigma of another flower of the same species. And that movement uh, can allow enough pollen to be transferred that some of it migrates down the stigma and to fertilize the, ov the ovule and to make a zygote plant. And then that, of course, leads to a a, a fruit, fruiting body, a seed or fruit, and uh, we call that pollination. And of course, insects, uh, many insects and birds uh, specialize on 
visiting flowers. Flowers basically secrete nectar, which is a sugar solution, uh, sucrose in water that attracts many pollinators. That's one of the reasons pollinators go to the, the flowers to get a uh, carbohydrate food source, but they also collect the pollen primarily as food as well. Um, I like to think of the honeybee diet, if you want to think about meat and potatoes, uh, the nectar is turned into honey, which is sort of the potatoes of the bees diet. And then everything else, the meat part of their diet is the pollen. Uh, the pollen has all the other nutrients that are important for the bees survival uh, and other pollinators do this as well is in the pollen. So they collect both from the flower. So nectar, uh, I've already told you what's important to beekeeping, at least part of our income comes from honey. We can trick honeybees into collecting a lot more nectar than they need to survive. And, uh, and then what we do is we harvest the excess and sell it as a product, a sweetener. I wanna show you the values of honey production and I'm gonna compare it to the values of pollination service by honeybees in the same year. And these were estimated every decade by Cornell. It's, they're, they're, they're gonna do it again this year. But uh, the last time they did it and it was published was in 2010. And in that year, the total honey produced in the United States was less than $300 million in value. Um, and I wanna compare that in the next few slides to the value of the pollination service by honeybees the same year. And most of you can probably guess it's higher, but how much higher? Um, so here again, is, uh, here are some honeybees collecting pollen and they, what they do is as they visit flowers to get nectar and or pollen, uh, their hairy bodies, the pollen sticks to them. And what they do is they groom themselves as they work the flowers. They kind of move the, the pollen off of their faces and then their antenna and put it onto their legs. And they eventually transfer the pollen all the way back to that rear leg. And they have a special place, we call it the pollen basket. They carry the pollen back to the hive. And there they unload it. Uh, they add microbes to it that ferment it and release the nutrients. And they basically turn it into a bread. Beekeepers call it bee bread. It smells really good too. And those fermenting bacteria, um, help the bees digest the pollen and give them the nutrients they need. So think of pollen as food to the bees point of view. And here's the values of pollination service in the United States from insects for that same year, 2010. And you can see honeybees, uh, the value was estimated about $19 billion of agricultural value from honeybee pollination. And then non-apis insects, most of that was leaf cutting bees, was another, and bumblebees was another $10 billion. So together, the, the bees, the insect pollinators accounted for about uh, one third the value of the pollination service that was needed that year, which was a total of about $82 billion. And that value is about 65, 67 times higher than the value of honey. So you can see from a clearly economic point of view, honeybees and are more valuable for their pollination service than they are for honey, unless of course you're a beekeeper who is selling the honey. Beekeepers also sell their pollination service, and I won't dwell on that today. It's a big business. Um, um, but what happens a lot of times when people think about insect pollinators, they often think just about honeybees. And one thing I want to point out is the honeybee is not even native to North America. It was brought here with our, our settlers, the Jamestown colony and, and, and Massachusetts colonies back in the 1600s. Um, and so our native bees sometimes get overlooked. And we, I don't know, in the United States, we probably have somewhere between three and 4,000 species of bees. And all of them pollinate something. And many of them are very good pollinators of our, our native plants for sure. And some of them, like bumblebees, are, are generalists like honeybees. They can cross over to some non-native plants um, and be pretty good at pollinating that as well. So <clears throat> bumblebees in particular are, are actually can be quite efficient at pollination at the individual bee level. Uh, and I'll talk about more of that, about that in a second, but I just wanna kind of clue you into their life history is, um, one of the things that's good about bumblebees is you can put them in a greenhouse. You can take a colony, you can actually buy now, commercially buy a box of bumblebees in a nest and put them in your greenhouse and open the door and let them go. And they will actually function in the greenhouse as if they were outdoors. They will fly from flower to flower collect food. If you offer them water, they'll collect water. And they can live in your greenhouse for two or three months until the colony kind of dissipates. And during that time, they can pollinate your, your crops in a greenhouse. And this is very important for greenhouse industries, especially greenhouse tomatoes in, in, in the Netherlands is a multi-million dollar a year uh, agricultural venture. And they're totally dependent on greenhouse bumblebees. Um, 
they're good for our gardens um, and the colonies are usually less than a few hundred. Uh, in the United States, bumblebee colonies tend to be about 200 to 600 individuals at the most. Um, one thing about bumblebees is their, their nests do not persist. You know, a honeybee colony will live as long as it can if, you know, through diseases and whatever, but honeybee colonies persist through the winter. Bumblebee colonies do not. They break down in the fall. At step four, we'll start there. At step four, the nest breaks down in the fall. Newly mated queens go and hide in the ground. And, and this is called a, a, a hibernaculum. And then when temperatures start to thaw in late February, early March, those queens will wake up. They visit flowers to get their first pollen mills. They collect pollen and go back and find a nest to build. And then they start raising baby bees in these little waxy cups. And once she's raised, that queen has raised about 10 baby bees. Uh, she will stop going out to get food and she just becomes the sole egg layer. And then all the new workers that have emerged, they're the ones that take care of the nest and go get the food. And, uh, and then late in the year, they produce a lot of males. The males mate with new females, and then the cycle starts all over again, just in case you didn't know the cycle of a bumblebee. These can be incredibly good garden pollinators. Um, here's some other bees that, some of these have been cultured for pollination. Just wanna give you a flavor for some of the other uh, non-apis pollinators. We have leaf cutter bees, the megachylids. Many of them, like the, black, uh, the blue orchard bee up in the upper left, have been cultured in these wooden blocks with straws. They like to nest in that kind of habitat. Many of our sweat bees, the helictids, they are also very good pollinators. And then minor bees like our endrinids, uh, these are just some of the smaller bee species that can be good pollinators and visit our gardens. Um, this is an extraordinarily good pollinator of blueberries. And this is a native bee that's found, especially down in our southern part of the state, uh, the southeastern blueberry bee. Uh, it's in, many blueberry growers in the Hattiesburg area try to encourage this bee by having uh, the landscape that's necessary for them to nest in, and they try not to plow it or disturb it, and they try and encourage these bees to nest around them so that they have them near their, their uh, blueberry trees because they're so good at pollinating blueberries. Um, anyway, I just wanted to give you an idea that honeybees aren't the only pollinators in the world, and there have been some big academic studies. This is one of the biggest ones where these guys looked at uh, all the major pollinators of crops throughout five continents in the world, and I forgot how many crops, it's something like 90 to 100 different crop systems. And they just said, well, if we just combine all those things together, who's more valuable, honeybees or native bees? And when they did this, they basically found that wild bee species, uh, they're very similar in value, but the wild bee species actually added more value overall, uh, $3,000 per hectare uh, compared to the honeybee. So, don't forget your native pollinators. Well, I'm gonna talk mostly about honeybees because that's my life. Uh, and they're the ones that we obviously see in our flowers. But when you think about pollinators, think about these other insects as well. Of course, butterflies and moths as well. One of the issues is, if, especially with honeybees and agriculture is, we need pesticides for managing problems, insects, weeds. And of course, these are chemicals that are toxic in nature and some of them are toxic to our pollinators. And so those two tensions have to be balanced properly or you end up killing a lot of pollinators. Um, so we need pesticides, insecticides for pest management, but we don't wanna kill our pollinators. So that's the tension. Um, let's just start the discussion. What happens if you accidentally kill some honeybees? Well, it turns out if that honeybee is a feral colony, if it's a wild bee, bee tree, or if they're living in your house, the side wall of your house, and you kill them, you haven't done anything illegal. If you kill a beekeeper's bees, it becomes illegal. So you could purposely, you can actually, even though pest control operators will tell you, we cannot kill bees in your house uh, if you're trying to get them out of your wall, that's actually not true. It's not illegal to do so. They just don't want to do it because they don't want to get stung. Um, but regardless, we want to be careful with how we use our pesticides. Now, if a beekeeper, a, a guy who has bees in his backyard, and he feels like his neighbor use some kind of pesticide that killed his bees, he can report that to the Bureau of Plant Industry, which is a branch of our Mississippi Department of Ag and Commerce. Uh, this is the same bureau that received complaints from farmer to farmer. So, so for example, suppose um, one farmer uses an herbicide that drifts onto another farmer and kills you know, several hundred acres of his, of his plants. Uh, this is where those issues are, are sort of litigated. Uh, 
The Bureau goes out, collects the evidence of the kill. They try and, and get samples and figure out what insecticide was used and then try to decide if there was illegal activity or, or abuse or just wrong use of insecticides that led to the death um, of the bees. Um, the other place that this can be reported is directly to the EPA. And many of these insecticides uh, have to be, these regulated compounds, pesticides and other insecticides, insecticides and other pesticides, they have to be registered and uh, every so often, periodically, they have to renew their registrations. And so if there's a flood of reports about, hey, this is killing a lot of honeybees in a certain area or killing a lot of butterflies it, when it's used this way, and those reports are sent to EPA, they collect those. And then when that product comes up for registration again, they decide if this is a, a high enough level of concern that now the registrant has to basically correct the issue. And, uh, and so it's good to report directly to EPA when you can. Oftentimes our Bureau of Plant Industry, if, if they feel like there's been a kill of, of bees from an insecticide, they'll automatically report it, but it doesn't hurt if the, if the beekeeper or homeowner reports it as well. And uh, so I think I've said all that. Um, now, <clears throat> if you're a pesticide applicator, uh, and this, this applies more to licensed applicators, but it's something you should think about as a homeowner too. If you've done something that's killed some bees and someone's complaining, you can actually be, uh, these things can happen to you. Uh, again, most of this is for applicators that are commercial applicators, but you can be cited, you can actually be fined, and uh, it can be criminally, I mean, if you did it on purpose to cause economic harm to the beekeeper, you can actually go to jail for it. So um, that's rare. I spent a lot of time trying to get better cooperation between farmers and beekeepers, and I found that the biggest problem is communication, just simply talking to one another, uh, knowing what's being used, when it's being used, um, and the beekeeper informing the farmer how he can better best help protect the bees. That's always the best thing that works, and so I spent a lot of time trying to forge those relationships. Um, in fact, you may have heard about what are called managed pollinator protection plans that uh, an acronym for them is the MP3s, and we, we developed, we were the first, one of the first states recently to develop these because we saw a need between uh, getting our soybean growers and cotton growers and beekeepers to better communicate so that we didn't kill so many bees in the Mississippi Delta in the summertime. And um, so I've done a lot of work with that, and a lot of what I tell them it applies to you as a homeowner. And so one of the first things you should understand is you, you should always read the label of any insecticide or pesticide you plan on using. And EPA has sort of changed the look of labels. And if there's a, a compound or a formulation that is a particular concern to its potential harm of, of pollinators, they use this B icon. So if you really wanna protect pollinators, as soon as you see that B icon, you should read all the information on that uh, label that pertains to the safest ways to use that product to avoid poisoning pollinators, bees and butterflies and moths. Um, and it's pretty clear, it's easy to read, and uh, the label has sort of a, a hierarchy of things. And it, I mean, it's pretty clear. They, they try and use simple bullet points uh, to kind of tell you the best ways to use that material uh, to reduce the risk of exposure and toxicity to bees. Um, so pay attention to the labels. It's the law anyway, but, um, if you really care about pollinators, just be sure and follow the labels as closely as you can. Um, there are <laughs> non-synthetic insecticide options. Um, a lot of people call these cultural options, but uh, you can use insecticidal soaps and oils, you know, sort of like safe soap or neem oil. Uh, they're non-toxic to bees once they're dry. Uh, and these might be appropriate for certain pest insects, soft-bodied insects like aphids or whatever that might be uh, harming your garden plant. Uh, some people are really into using biocontrol, actually buying predatory insects. Uh, you can actually purchase some of these things and release them in your garden. Um, and of course, you can also release uh, entomopathic uh, fungi or bacteria. They can also be purchased and uh, many of them are sprayed onto the garden and they can be used to control insect pests. Um, in, Usually, none of these techniques by themselves are very effective uh, by themselves, but it used in combination, two or three of these things can often control the pest problem, and you can avoid the use of the hard chemical insecticides or pesticides. Um, it just depends on the situation, the insect uh, pest you might be dealing with on your plants. 
whether or not these would work. But it's always worth a try and some people really want to avoid using chemicals in their gardens and they try it. This is just to warn you that just because something's approved for organic use, it doesn't mean it's always safe. So, so for example, this is a, 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 a fungus that's uh, normally used as a pathogen for certain, uh, certain insects, but you can see it can be highly lethal to leafcutter bees. So, so just because it's organic and it's a, a biocontrol agent doesn't mean it's necessarily safe for all bees and all pollinators. So you've gotta be careful just because it's considered organic doesn't necessarily mean it's completely safe. So again, follow the label. Usually there's warnings on the label uh, that say, hey, normally these kind of pathogens don't harm bees, but this one does. Um, so be careful. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is just to review uh, why we're sitting here, um, uh, just to make sure you've been listening. And so what percentage of North American plants are pollinated by, by native bees? And since I can't hear you uh, respond, we'll, I'll just give you the answer, that's 75%. This icon on the label is just to, to basically reflexively call your attention to this product being particularly dangerous, potentially dangerous to pollinators. So pre, uh, pay more details to the bullet points underneath that icon for specific directions on avoiding uh, poisoning pollinators. And then these are all the things that can happen to a a bas basically a pesticide applicator who has killed bees and or other pollinators. Uh, these are the, the litig litigate actions that can happen to them. Uh, two more questions before we go on. The state regulatory agency in Mississippi uh, in which bee kills are reported is the Bureau of Plant Industry, which is part of Mississippi Department of Ag and Commerce. And then again, chemical alternatives to hard pesticides you know, sometimes you hear people refer to synthetic pesticides or insecticides as hard pesticides, and the more organic options or more natural options are often called soft chemicals. Uh, but anyway, uh, chemical alternatives are more effective when used in combination than if used alone, and that is true. Okay. All right, so let's just move on. And now let's just talk about ways that you as a homeowner or a home user of pesticides can think about better protecting pollinators. and the first thing you should understand is that that the risk of killing a pollinator or or any target animal, or actually these are non-targets, you don't want to kill them, is uh, a, a function of two things, the exposure and the toxicity. And the toxicity is sort of an innate chemistry thing uh, that's determined by standard testing on how these chemicals act either acutely or orally on killing an insect. And those they're actually measured. We can determine lethal dose that kills 50% of a population of insects and it can be standardized. Um, so it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a value that can be measured and it's inherent to the chemistry uh, uh, being used. And then the exposure is, is whether or not the, uh, the degree to which the insect can contact the material and actually acquire a dose that might cause them harm. And you as a homeowner can control both of these um, by how you use it and what you choose to use. Um, and so my, my advice is try and always, if you have options, and usually you do, there's more than one option to kill a target pest insect in a garden, choose the least toxic first. And then of course you choose an exposure that's gonna reduce the exposure to pollinators. So for example, you would never try, uh, never apply insecticides directly to blooming crops if you can all avoid it at all. The point is if you put toxins on the flowers and the pollinators visit the flowers, they're gonna contact the toxins. So it's just common sense. Um, by not applying it to flowering plants, you've avoided um, an exposure. And by using the least toxic chemical you can find, you're, you're reducing the chance that even if they do contact it, that the, list, the risk, the response will be a lethality of the colony. So this was a question before we started and I couldn't remember, oh, I guess it was, I guess I did have them all. I just, what I ended up doing was grouping the organophosphates and carbamates in my, my head and that's because they have the same mode of action. So here are the compounds that are most often seen in honeybee deaths and, and some other pollinators as well. Organophosphates and carbamates, and then the neonicotinoids and the pyrethroids. Uh, someone asked this before we even started. So those are the four. Of course, uh, a lot of toxins, a lot of insecticides can uh, be toxic to, to pollinators, but these are commonly associated with like commercial bee deaths. Uh, that little 
Pacific Northwest guide that uh, is in the Google Drive that uh, Christian put up uh, actually has tables that list insecticides in these three groups that I'm going to present to you. So if you have a question about, you know, hey, is this in that highly toxic group or the moderately toxic or the low toxic group, you can actually look them up. But the uh, highly toxic ones to pollinators include uh, carbaryl, malathion, and permethrin, and many more. Uh, there's a moderately toxic group, cubophos, fluvalinate, and pyrethrum. Those are pyrethroids and one organophosphate there. And then there's a relatively non-toxic group, amitraz, dicofol, and teb, I can't even say bufinazide. Um, anyway, there's tables for these, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit later. There's actually some online uh, databases where you can simply type in the uh, product name of something you, you're going to use, and it'll tell you the information on the relative toxicity to pollinators and other things, if you want to look it up that way. The other point I want to make in, so, <coughs> excuse me. So one of the first choices you can make is if you have two insecticides that you could use to control your insect pest and one is in group one, which are the worst toxic ones, and one's in group three, uh, try to use the one that's in group three. That's the kind of thing you can do to, to help pollinators better. You know, try and choose the relatively non-toxic one um, so that's the first choice you can make. And then what we have to talk about is this formulation, the concept of formulation. You know, how is the insecticide um, being delivered to the environment? And it turns out dust are the worst in terms of pollinator safety. Uh, dust are, and even microencapsulate, I'm putting that in the same group. These tend to be small particles that, of course, apply to the plant. And they're very attractive and get caught in the hairs of pollinators. And the pollinators, when they get in on their bodies, they think of it as pollen. And they end up collecting it and bringing it home into the food chain. Honeybees colonies often get pesticides into their bee bread because the bees accidentally pick up dust and things like that and bring them back to the colony. So those kind of formulations, dust and microencapsulate, are the worst because bees think of them as pollen. Um, as we go down the list, the, the least toxic to bees is a granular, something you apply, uh, the, the best example I can give you the minutes, Amdro, you apply it on the ground around fire ant mounds, well, honeybees rarely contact it. They don't, they're not attracted to coming to that granular. So even if, if it's relatively toxic to bees, they're not attracted to the formulation and they don't get exposed to it. So it's really good. And then there's a lot of things in the middle. It turns out that the more water-soluble insecticide, that's as you go down the list, like soluble powder and solution, the more water-soluble insecticide, the less toxic it is to bees. Things, when you see an emulsifiable concentrate, what that means is insecticides are generally fat-soluble and they need, they're not very water-soluble, so often they need a carrier to get them to go into water. Well, those carriers also make it easier for them to get into bees, so the more of that stuff you have in there, the likely the more toxic it is to bees. So uh, that's sort of what we mean by formulation. So if you had a choice between a dust and a granular uh, to treat this pest, if you can, you got to use the granular. And so I think I've covered all this, yeah. Um, we'll talk about residual time in a minute. Uh, uh, so I'll just leave that uh, for later, residual time. <coughs> so here's that example of Amdro. You know, the granulars are applied to the ground. They're often broadcast like this. Of course, uh, foraging insects on the ground, uh, like ants, are attracted to it. Honeybees are not, um, and therefore it's relatively safe to use around honeybees. Uh, other situations that can be safer for, for pollinators is to use bait stations, especially those laced with pheromones. Pheromones are often species-specific chemicals that insects use to communicate with one another, and often they're sex pheromones, and it's a way of attracting insects to traps, um, and you know, if it's a pheromone that's not uh, specific to honeybees, they ignore it. They don't. They're not attracted to it. Uh, and then sticky traps uh, can also just, you know, they're tacked like tanglefoot or some kind of sticky oil can be a barrier to insects. Again, if the honeybees are attracted to the wind tunnel in this case or the uh, the tunnel here, uh, they're not going to be caught in these sticky traps to any significant numbers. Um, one thing you do want to watch out for is sometimes people make their own bait traps for ants. This is often for ants or similar insects. And they'll use the sugar as a bait with like borax. In this case, there's three different sugars. Well, honeybees are attracted to sugars and their degree of attractiveness to sugars depends on how much food's out there. In the springtime, they might completely ignore an open trap like this, but this time of year, they're really hungry. 
if you set the, either of these outside right now around my, my bees out here, they would be on it in a heartbeat. Uh, two minutes later, you'll have bees on this and they will contact it. Uh, they'll bring their sisters back, they'll take this back to the nest and it will poison a lot of bees. So if you use these kind of traps to, to bring in ants, you need to protect other insects, flying insects, bees from it with some kind of shield or mesh to keep bees out. So keep that in mind. All right, so we had a question about systemic insecticides earlier. The neonicotinoids is a soil drench. Um, most of the insecticides you buy are contact, uh, the ones you buy in your garden store. And the toxicity can vary, and sometimes it can last up to three weeks. Um, um, and one thing to keep in mind, if you, if you spray these directly on flowers in bloom, that's where the biggest risk is to bees. If you spray, spray a plant and it flowers after your application, the flowers aren't at risk to, to uh, providing a poison to the bees. So that's the beauty of, of these things. You can actually control the, their use better. The systemics are basically soil drenches, and, uh, tree and trunk injections or seed treatments in which the insecticide basically soaks into the plant tissue, gets translocated through the plant, and it often can end up in some many situations, you can end up in, in, in the nectar or pollen on that plant, and that's where the risk is to the pollinator. Um, certain situations we have found, uh, scientists have found that yes, neonicotinoid seed treatments, for example, can have, end up in high uh, enough values in, in the pollen, uh, the nectar, the pollen of corn or the nectar of some other agricultural crops that is dangerous for bees and even butterflies. Uh, it's highly variable and again, it depends on, on the rate of the seed treatment or the soil drench you're using. So if you're giving a choice, if you're gonna do a soil drench to protect your crepe myrtle, if you can use a low rate, um, you know, the lowest rate possible to get your control of the problem, that's what you want to do. And that'll eliminate, uh, not eliminate, but it'll lower the risk to your pollinators. Um, um, I cannot tell you that it's completely safe, though. Um, I don't know enough about, you know, I don't think any of these systemics are completely safe. There's a lot of research being done. Um, there are certain things you could do to minimize the risk uh, and using a, the lowest rate possible is one of the things you can do. All right, so I'm gonna show you eight, eight sort of things to think about when you apply an insecticide. And when we think about those things, we wanna think about how the, these items are affecting the exposure and or toxicity to the pollinators. So the first ones are gr plant growth stage. So if you look at these tomatoes at the bottom, which, which stage is, is the one that's most likely to bring in a pollinator? Well, it's obviously the one with the flowers. So one of the simplest ways you can protect pollinators is not to spray blooming plants with flowers open. Now that's easy to say, and let me tell you why this is often difficult in agriculture. Right now, some of the biggest honey crops right now in, in Mississippi, beekeepers, there's about 20,000 colonies of bees right now on soybeans in Mississippi because soybean makes a nice honey. And an, another few thousand are on cotton because it also makes a nice honey. The problem is both those plants are continually blooming depending on the type of, 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 of crop planted, uh, but they do bloom. And these soybean growers and cotton growers often have pest issues when there's bloom. So guess what? They end up having to apply insecticides when there's a bloom. You as a homeowner may have better choices than they do. But when they've got 10,000 acres of soybeans out there and there's a pest problem, whether it's blooming or not, they're gonna save their plant. And our beekeepers have to be aware of that, the ones that are getting uh, soybean honey, and they're gonna to have to basically adjust how they do their beekeeping and try and mitigate the, the problem as best they can. Um, so I guess what I'm trying to tell you is certain farmers know it's better not to spray a, a blooming plant, but they have no choice if they wanna save their crop. Now you as a homeowner have a smaller garden and a smaller tree issue. And so maybe you have better, a better control of your environment and can better control your application so you don't hit a blooming plant. Um, I should also say, the other thing you don't wanna do, I guess I'll, I'll, save, I'll save that for the drift part. Never mind, I'm gonna move on. So I've already mentioned this, but when you are choosing your insecticide, this is number two, choose the least toxic to bees to begin with. So go to those tables, either go to the internet or go to the, the handout that you can access uh, from Christian's um, um, links and look up, you know, and try to find the least toxic option. Now, once you find the chemical that's least toxic, also try to find the lowest rate that you can use to effectively control your insect pest problem. 
And then again, choose the right formulation. Don't use a dust. If you, you know, if you have carbaryl in the form of a dust or carbaryl in the form of a, a, a aqueous solution, choose the one that's an aqueous solution. And then one thing that's on the labels is called residual activity. And this is the time it takes for an insecticide to break down in the environment on the plant. And it's often listed as RT25. It's the time for the insecticide to break down, leaving 25% of the material behind. And in general, for pollinator protection, you want to use an RT25 that's less than eight hours. In other words, it breaks down substantially in eight hours. Anything longer than that, you know, especially if you start to get out to 12 hours or so, becomes riskier for insects and uh, pollinators when you uh, apply that material to a plant. All right, because it's just, it's just persisting too long. All right, now the issue of drift. Um, I think in this handout I said to avoid wind speeds at 10 mile per hour. The guides on the labels often tell you less than that, three to five mile per hour is what some guys worry about. So one of the things you wanna worry about is if you're spraying something in the environment, watch wind speed. Um, but also more importantly, think about what you're spraying. And so for example, let's say you have a garden with, that has an ornamental water source in it. Like uh, some people have little water features or waterfalls near their gardens. Last thing you wanna do is hit a water source, either a drainage ditch near a garden or an artificial pond or whatever that pollinators might drink out of with insecticide. They will go to the water, they could potentially pick up lethal dose of insecticide. So you're controlling drift, you're trying to keep your pesticide and your target problem plant, let's say. You don't want to go to water sources, you don't want it to blow directly onto nest of bees as well if you've got bees nearby. Uh, so watch your drift. Um, Temperature is real important. <clears throat> insecticides break down by sunlight and also just the kinetics of warm temperature. And if you, if you apply an insecticide and it suddenly gets cooler over the next two or three days, that insecticide is gonna persist in the environment longer than normal. And that's riskier for your pollinators. So if there's a cold spell coming, uh, maybe you don't wanna apply the pesticide until after it warms up a bit uh, because the colder temperatures are gonna make that insecticide persist in the environment longer on your plants and it's more likely to come in contact with your pollinators. If you know there are bee colonies nearby, what's your, one thing you should understand as a homeowner, bees fly about two miles comfortably, a mile and a half to two miles comfortably to get food. So if you know that there are bees close by and you know they're visiting your garden, you really need to be careful because um, you know they're there and uh, uh, spraying blooming plants is where you're gonna get them. But if they're really close to your yard, like I'm a beekeeper, so I often use pesticides in my yard near my bees. Well, I know if I'm 25, 30 feet away, the stuff doesn't go directly in my bee colonies. The way I'm using it's gonna be safe. So don't stay, stay from, away from spraying close to your bees and then uh, watch out for spraying blooming plants so that the bees don't come to it from a, a longer location. And then this is very important for pollinators, time of the application, time of day. It turns out most of our insect pollinators, especially honeybees and similar, tend to go out for food about 10 in the morning to 2 p.m. in the summertime. And that's the peak of their foraging activity. It's not saying you're not gonna see these insects on flowers at other times. It's just that's when most of them are out. So if you have a choice of time of day, if you can apply an insecticide late in the afternoon, and if it has a low residual time, let's say eight hours, it'll be gone. It'll break down a lot by the next morning and be of little or no consequence to your pollinator. So that's the kind of thing you need to think about. So. I always encourage beekeepers, I mean, a pesticide applicators, if they can, apply late in the afternoon if you can. It's not always possible, but if you can, that's, that's best for your, your, your bee pollinators in, in particular. All right, so I'm just gonna move on to some other things. Uh, I don't even know if this program still exists because there's been a lot of cuts to some of these programs. This was an Obama administration program where they were trying to increase pollinator uh, habitat on roadsides, providing food and also power line cuts and, and uh, utility right of ways. Um, it still may exist out there. I just don't know what their funding is. Um, so, and this is just to emphasize that it's not just pesticide use. One thing we have to keep in mind is herbicides. Um, herbicides in general are fairly non-toxic to bees. Some are more toxic than others, direct to directly toxic. But what they do do is they kill the food the bees eat. So 
broadcast use of herbicides can wipe out food sources for bees at critical times. And so keep that in mind. And this was one effort to kind of offset, offset the loss of uh, food habitat for pollinators. It's just sort of let's use our roadsides better and our, our utility uh, right of ways better. So I guess what I would say is that as a gardener or a homeowner, if you can leave places with native wildflowers growing uh, abundantly without mowing and tilling, that's a great thing to help with your pollinators. Like I said, there are a couple databases here. If you, if you have a question about a pesticide you want to use, you can quickly look it up, go online, and these will provide uh, information such as safety data safety, uh, data safety sheets, uh, and they often give you um, information about how to protect pollinators and so forth. <coughs> but either one of these, they're pretty good. Um, this is just, um, this is my attempt to show you how complicated things can be for commercial beekeepers. Um, you're a homeowner and you're, as being a homeowner, and let's say it's a home garden, you're also the applicator. So the communication chain is pretty short, it's just you. Uh, but with commercial beekeepers, the bees are being hired. This is almonds, for example. Beekeepers being hired to bring his bees to almonds. Well, the guy who looks at his bees and says they're healthy enough to do the job is the bee broker. And he's the one that reports to the owner leaser and says, okay, your beekeeper's here, his bees look good, they're ready to use. And then there's this farm manager and look where the applicator is. He's way down the chain in this, this chain of, of uh, command. And the question is, <laughs> what's the communication of the toxicity of what's being used to the beekeeper? Uh, you can imagine, uh, it gets weaker and weaker as the chain goes. So this is why we have many more problems in our commercial industries is because we have too many people and the link between, that aren't always communicating well together. So keep that in mind if you had to be near a beekeeper. If you feel like there's a beekeeper in harm's way, let's say the neighbor has five colonies in the backyard and you're getting ready to use something, you might wanna have a conversation with him rather than just using it and then accidentally kill his bees, uh, that kind of thing. Um, let's see, before I go on, um, oh, I lost my train of thought. I was gonna say something else, I just forgot it. Oh, well, let's go on to the questions then. So which pesticide formulation is most toxic to bees? You should know dust, and the second one is probably microencapsulated, which are like dust. Uh, most pesticides available to homeowners are systemic poisons. That's false. Most of the ones you buy are contact. You can certainly get systemic, uh, but most of the ones you buy are, are contact. Permethrin, malathion, and carboryl fall into B, toxicity group three, relatively non-toxic. That is false. These are actually in group one. The most, the most toxic. Uh, number four, when using a sugar-based insecticide bait station, what important factor must be considered? And of course, that is shielding, somehow shielding uh, flying pollinators from contacting the sugar bait. Um, in terms of pollinator safety, it is better to apply a pesticide when temperatures are low or high. It's, and the answer is it's better to apply when they're high because it leads to faster breakdown of the pesticide. Now that's in terms of pollinator safety. Now, if you want to kill an insect pest, that's not necessarily the hot, you know, the best thing you want. You want that insecticide to stick around long enough to kill the pest. But so that's why there's always this tension, you know. Uh, but if you really want to protect pollinators, you try and 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 only apply when the temperatures are relatively warm. All right, I think that's all I have, and uh, I don't know if I went too long or not. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, I haven't been keeping up with the time. Uh, if you want to contact me about beekeeping issues or even pesticide issues related to pollinators, uh, that's my email. And I don't have a work phone anymore. I used to have a work work office phone and a work, or, uh, work cell phone and my personal. I just got sick of having three phones. So I do everything with my personal cell phone now.